Good afternoon, everyone. Sarah Barker with the Empowering Aging Podcast. And today I have with me a repeat guest on the podcast, my good friend, Chris Orestes, who is a certified senior advisor, and he's also the president of Retirement Genius. Uh, you guys are in for a complete treat from learning from Chris today about ways that we can avoid long-term care bankruptcy. Chris, thank you so much for being my guest. Oh, Sarah, it's always a pleasure. Glad to be back and glad to see you as always. Thank you. So this topic, we know in the senior care industry that one of the number one concerns that families have, whether it's the care recipient themselves, the well spouse, the adult children, the question is, how am I going to be able to afford this? Well, that, you know, that's the big problem. And, and we all know this and, and your listeners know this, is that the, the topic of long-term care is something people avoid. They don't want to think about it. They're certainly not planning for it. Most people just don't consider this something that either is going to happen to them or they've got to worry about today. Kick that can down the road. And, and what ends up happening for so many people is all of a sudden they're caught short. They, they, the two biggest things that people look for online when they're Google searching about long-term care is what kind of care for my loved one and how do I pay for it? Mm -hmm. And it's not that hard to find what kind of care you look at home care companies, you look at assisted living, you look at memory care, you look at skilled nursing, whatever the case may be. There's lots of options and lots of resources that will help you get to those care providers. The question then becomes though, now that you've found the care that you want, how are you going to pay for it? And that answering that question is a lot harder. It is. And not only how are you going to pay for it up front, but especially, you know, for my, my community, the senior care community, it's how can we make recommendations on how to go about paying for care in a way that will be sustainable? And you have this great analogy where in many situations, people will rush to do the Medicaid planning. And you make this analogy between um, eating steak and lobster or your oatmeal and your orange juice. And so let's kind of set the stage with you sharing your philosophy around that and why we should be using alternative funding solutions if, if it applies to these people's situations versus just immediately going down the path of thinking I have to, you know, deplete my funds and, and plan for, for Medicaid. Yeah, well, let's remember, you know, Medicaid was established uh, decades ago, 1965, as part of uh, the Great Society Initiative of Lyndon Johnson, okay? And it was designed to be a uh, safety net for people who could not pay for care. It's, it's, it's welfare. It's for people who are impoverished. So Medicaid, uh, over the years, somehow grew into the number one payer of long-term care services for seniors in this country, a program designed to provide care for people who, who are below the poverty line, a cottage industry sp sprang up to help seniors spend down and put themselves into a poverty position to be able to go on to Medicaid to pay for care. So, so when it comes to Medicaid planning and going on to Medicaid, be careful for, for what you wish for, because you might end up getting it. You, you'll end up on Medicaid. And now you're below the poverty level. You've gotten rid of all of your assets and income. You're now a ward of the state. And mm -hmm. you are going to go to wherever the approved Medicaid care provider uh, is in your area. Typically, it's going to be a nursing home. There, some people can apply for uh, Medicaid covered skilled care at home, but it's very rare to actually get that coverage. Uh, the vast majority of people are going to end up in a nursing home sharing a room with one or two other people. Uh, and they're not going to get the same experience as somebody who has the means to remain private pay and mm -hmm. then choose where and when they're going to get their care at home, an mm -hmm. assisted living community, maybe even in a skilled nursing facility, a memory care facility. Mm -hmm. Private pay is where now you're in control. That is the opportunity to preserve dignity and choice because you're in control of when and where you're going to get your care. Medicaid, the government decides all that for you, and you're going to get what you qualify for. And so that analogy of, and, and I can tell you, Sarah, it's true. 
I've been to assisted living communities that are like Ritz Carlton's. They're they're unbelievable. I, I I've looked at some of them and thought I'd like to live here. They're having cocktail parties. They're going on on trips to the malls and museums and theaters. Uh, they're having fantastic dining, literally barbecues. I've seen I've seen uh, twin lobster dinners at, at at assisted living communities, but that's private pay. So if you want to be on the steak, lobster, and cocktail party plan. That's private pay. Medicaid, you're in a nursing home and you're getting the meals that they provide at a nursing home, which will meet all government standards for nutrition, but you're not going to see steak and lobster on that menu. And there's a reason it exists. What we're trying to say, though, is that be careful about rushing into it, right? Because maybe deplete all of the resources that you have to have the way of living that you want at that point in your aging journey until it becomes you have no other option but to apply for Medicaid versus rushing into it. Well, that's right. Medicaid is the option of last resort, whereas Mm -hmm. private pay is what should be your first resort. Mm -hmm. Um, So now, clearly, I'm sure the audience can tell that you are extremely intelligent when it comes to this topic. Well, Sarah, don't let the bow tie fool you. Oh, so it's just a mask. <laughs> well, no, you know, it, it, it takes a certain level of intelligence just to tie one of these things. <laughs> it's not a clip on. Do you actually tie no, a bow tie? No, not a clip on. <laughs> well, I'm impressed because I didn't even know that you tied bow ties. I thought it was only ties. <laughs> I've been doing it since I was a kid. <laughs> well, I'm impressed by that then. Um, but before we, we jump into the slide deck um, so they can have a visual with the education you're about to provide, could you please share with the audience your your background, what you were doing, and now what led you to be doing the work that you are now? Oh, yeah. I'm, no, I'm happy to. I've been, I've been around the long-term care world and the financial services, insurance, retirement world for, I hate to say it, close to 30 years. Uh, My career started in Washington, D.C. I worked in politics. I worked in the White House. I worked on Capitol Hill for the Senate Majority Leader. And and then after some time, uh, I went uh, into uh, working for trade associations that represented the insurance industry. So I was working as a lobbyist for the Health Insurance Association of America and then for uh, a time, the uh, Life Insurance Association. And in those years, we there was a lot of focus, this is in the 90s, on long-term care and what was coming with the aging baby boomers. The baby boomers hadn't started turning 65 yet. That was still in the future. And there was a lot of emphasis on, well, long-term care insurance would be the way that people would be able to pay for care and, and a lot of education, a lot of effort to get people to, to purchase long-term care insurance was put in. But what ended up happening was people did purchase it, but it wasn't uh, priced right by the insurance companies. Yeah. And people ended up over time hanging on to those policies, but there were rate increases and there was uh, uh, companies got out of the long-term care insurance world and it started to limit the options for what would be the private pay solutions for people to pay for care? And as I looked at that equation and I left Washington, D.C., we about over 15 years ago now started a company to focus on how could we help people access private pay solutions that whether they had long term care insurance or not would give them other options, particularly at the time that they needed care. And so we started looking at some of the innovative options that were out there in the marketplace, things like reverse mortgages and using someone's home as a way to help pay for care, or the veterans aid and attendance benefit, that uh, that benefit for veterans to help them pay for care, accessing things like senior bridge loans. And then another area we looked at that we thought was very interesting was what's called a life settlement. Somebody who owns a life insurance policy can sell their policy. If they're no longer going to keep it, they don't want to pay the premiums anymore. They're going to let it go. It's actually an asset with market value that they can access, sell it, get money in a very tax advantaged way that they can turn around and use for care. So we focused in on making sure that people had the information and access to that solution 
We work, we've worked with home care companies, assisted living companies, financial advisors, elder law attorneys for years to help guide families and them towards these solutions as a way to address the need for care at the time care is needed. The good thing about these alternative solutions is these aren't things that you necessarily would need to have purchased years in advance for the use of long-term care. If you're going to have long-term care insurance, you're going to buy it when you're younger, healthier, and you're going to pay those premiums and carry it for many years, possibly decades before you would mm -hmm. use it. But in the case of these other opportunities, you're using either your, your status or an asset that you've owned for years in a, in a different way at the time you need care. And that led us to where we are today now with Retirement Genius working across the country with all sorts of care providers, financial advisors, legal advisors, helping them and the families they work with get to these solutions so the families can afford to pay for care using solutions that they may not even realize that they have access to. Well, and we have learned, and I'm very grateful to, to you, um, you've been part of the Alternative Funding Solutions panel for the Senior Care Sales Solutions Academy, just about every single one now. Um, mm -hmm to date alongside Carmen Perry and, and Kelly Rogers. Yes. And so this concept of life settlement, we've seen in the academies, which are mostly comprised of, of home care professionals, it seems to be a brand new concept to that sector of the industry. But the truth is, it's not new. Like you had already been in collaboration with many senior living communities across the country for years before even it seems the home care side of the care industry uh, was becoming educated on this as an option. Yeah, it, it, it is interesting. What we always said about working and educating people, whether they're in the care industry or the financial industry or the legal industry, it's kind of like painting the, the, the Golden Gate Bridge. You, you, as soon as you're done painting the Golden Gate Bridge, you got to go back and start painting it all over again. And it's the same with educating people about these solutions. We're constantly out there educating people about these solutions, and the job is never done. Mm -hmm. We have helped fund millions of dollars of private pay across this country over the years, putting people into assisted living communities, keeping them aging in place at home, helping them go into memory care, skilled nursing environments with the use of an asset like their life insurance policy or, or, or other uh, their home or their veteran status so that they were able to access something that, that for many, they didn't even know that they could. And for many of the care providers, even though they have some, some sense of that there are these financial solutions out there. What I've, I've always found interesting in the industry is, is a tendency to be comfortable talking about your service. If you're, if you're a home care provider, you're telling them, you know, here's our rates, here's what we provide, here's, here's what we do. Uh, and then it's sort of crossing your finger that they're going to be able to afford it. And I've seen it with assisted living communities, bring a family in, give them a tour, host them for lunch, they leave and then the fingers are crossed that now hopefully they can get back and pull out a checkbook and start paying for all this. Mm -hmm. And and what we've always said to, to, to particularly the care providers is you want to do more than that. That's just part of the equation. That's just sort of setting up the discussion. Mm -hmm. But it's it's taking it forward to being a solution provider because it's again, it's not hard to tell people what you do, but it is hard for them to figure out how they're going to pay for what you do and to be able to access it right. to be able to access it and that is my hope the the goal right is to redefine with the work that i'm doing redefine the way senior mm -hmm. care professionals serve referral partners and families and that means you have to be able to have a deeper conversation with these families um, with the care recipients and their families to help uncover the options that exist right, to, to give them access through uncovering funds to pay for this. And so without further ado, let's dive into the presentation, because I think it's this part where the audience is going to find a lot of value and recognize that they could be doing their job better as a home care owner, better as a home care marketer, better really as any type of senior care professional in being able to offer resources to these families to get the care that they deserve but also understanding they don't have to be an expert in this. That's why we have resources like you to connect the families to. 
Yeah, that and let and as we're bringing it up, let me emphasize that point. I think a hesitation for many to bring up these 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 financial options is they feel like, well, I'm not an expert in it. I don't want to get asked a bunch of questions I don't know the answer to, or I, I somehow don't want to insult the family by suggesting that they can't afford what we're talking about. But what we're saying is it, you don't need to present anything in detail. You don't need to talk to people in, in an assumptive way as if they can't afford it. It's just, look, if you want to look at some various financial options for how you can help pay for these services, we can pre- we can provide you some experts that we work with who will explain it all to you. Hand them off to the experts that, that you're able to work with through groups like us, and then let us do that work for you on your behalf. Work with the family, take them through the, the discovery process of understanding what might be the right fit for them, and then going forward into into the process of applying for it, qualifying for it, and accessing it. On any of these, you're talking about uh, you know 90 days or less to, to mm-hmm. access these, these services if you're working with professionals who know what they're doing and, and bringing you back a family that, that can afford the care versus you educated them on what you do and then they moved on looking for, for other options that they could afford when maybe having talked to you without realizing it, they could have afforded it to begin with, send them to a group that that knows what they're doing that you can work with, let them take care of it for And it's a market differentiator, right? We're all trying really to talk is. to the same high value target referral sources and say about how we're different. And uh, my question often to the students or my clients is, okay, how are you really different, right? Because at the end of the day, we're all doing the same thing and agencies right. will have specialty programs and you know, maybe you have more caregivers than the other agency, you have better communication streams. Like there, there are some differentiators, but, but the person who is out in the field developing relationships with referral sources, and here's a perfect example, that social worker at a skilled nursing facility, a common objection, our patients can't afford your services. Right. Well, what are, what's your process to determine that? Because I might have solutions for you here at agency XYZ. We have access to alternative funding solutions to be able to help these patients. So right. anyway, I love this topic. Very grateful um, for your support over the last couple of years. So let's dive in now. All right. So, so I'll take you through a 15, 20 minute presentation that that will kind of organize what we've been talking about in a cohesive way, which by the way, all this information is available. You can always reach out to Sarah and, and, and get the, the information that we're covering here. And then if you want to, to, to use these services through Sarah, you, you'll always be able to access them. But let's start with what we, what, this is a presentation we've given that we talk about how to avoid LTC bankruptcy. And that's what I was saying at the beginning. If you go on to Medicaid, in essence, you're this side of bankrupt. You've become, you're living below the poverty level now and you're a ward of the state. So for us, just as a quick introduction, Retirement Genius, we're an information and resource platform working with professionals and with families to help them build and live a well-balanced retirement. So we focus on financial information and tools, health, long-term care information and tools, and then lifestyle information and tools so that people can retire like a genius is, is, is our tag that we like to, to, to promote to people. So what, what are the fears of retirees? Well, it's that they're not going to have enough money to maintain their lifestyle. These, these are the big fears that are driving people in retirement and they're well-founded because people are coming into retirement oftentimes with not enough saved and invested, overly reliant on social security and, and maybe on a, on a path to, to Medicaid, which is the definition of, in essence, running out of money. The fear is running out of money and then becoming dependent on others, dependent on family, dependent on friends, and, and, and losing your ability to live independently. Ultimately, the need for long-term care, which, as we talked about, is something people want to not think about. They want to think it's not going to happen to them. The reality is the vast majority of people 65 and older are eventually going to need to pay for some kind of long-term care, uh, which they will be inadequately prepared for. That fear of getting to that point and then whether they want to or not ending up on Medicaid uh, 
will really undermine what you may have envisioned being the retirement in, in golden years you would hope to be living. So as we've said, preparing for long-term care, it's something that people don't want to think about. And, and so let's look at some statistics and what those are telling us uh, about people's preparation for long-term care in this country. So think about this. For a long time, we've been talking about baby boomers turning 65 in this country. For many people, particularly professionals, you, you hear the stat, baby boomers are turning 65 at a rate of 10,000 people a day, which is true. But guess what? Those baby boomers in less than a year now start turning 80. So we've really crossed a, a, a threshold when it comes to aging and demographics. 70% of those people, 65 and older, are going to need some form of long-term care, whether they believe it or not. Millions of people get long-term care. The, the, the formal long-term care numbers that are reported in this country are to, to, to the tune of millions, and then millions more informal care provided by family, not, not reported. So we have really tens of millions of people in this country who are receiving long-term care formally or informally every year. And as people are entering their retirement years, 65 and above as of now, you're looking as a, as a couple at spending in the neighborhood of $300,000 or more out of pocket on your health care and long-term care needs. So who's paying for care? We know it's a, we know it's an expensive proposition in the neighborhood of about, five, on average, across this country, about $5,000 a month for home care, assisted living a little bit more at $4,500. And then skilled nursing is, is a very expensive proposition if you're private pay. Most people go in at, 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 on Medicaid. And then as you break down the funding sources, Medicare, Medicaid combined uh, are covering a little over half of, of costs. Remember, Medicare is only gonna cover short-term rehabilitation care. Medicaid will cover long-term care, but to get onto it, you have to, to qualify both medically and financially. So that leaves private pay. About, about a third of, of care in this country is covered out of pocket. Uh, and then for long-term care insurance policies, only about 4% of care in this country is covered by long-term care insurance policies. So, so for those people who have bought long-term care insurance, you made a great investment. And I encourage you to do all you can to hold on to that policy. Uh, but most people have not. So what then becomes the options for people that haven't paid for care? You know, start with just the difference between perception and reality. What people assume, the vast majority of people assume that, that they're not going to need long-term care. They've said, well, you know, if I experience some kind of care event or a loved one, then that might prompt us to want to buy long-term care insurance. But guess what? the horse is already out of the barn. If you have had, if you're too old or you're starting to experience uh, declining health, you're most likely going to be rejected for long-term care insurance. So the reality is most people admit they've done little to no planning, but they have this confidence that, well, it doesn't matter because it's not going to happen to me. And if it did, I'd figure it out. We'd figure out how to pay for it. There's something that would cover me. I paid my taxes into government programs and for so many people that get caught at that point, it becomes a very rude awakening for them. For so many families, the first time they start to realize what's going on is in a hospital, gathered around a loved one with, with discharge uh, uh, coming within 24 hours and being asked the question, you know, what do you have to cover moving this person into uh, a, a longer term care environment? And all of a sudden, people are thrown into the deep end, scrambling to try and figure out what they're going to do, understand the terminology, understand the rules, understand what's covered, what's not, how to qualify. Uh, and too many families in an urgent position with the clock ticking all of a sudden have to rush in and try and figure this out. When you look at the amount of insurance policies that are out there, and, and you know, what are the private pay options, insurance being one of them? Well, okay, long-term care insurance policies. There's about 7.5 million long-term care insurance policies in force today in this country. There's 335 million people living in this country, and only 7.5 million have long-term care insurance. Now, the good news is there's over 260 million life insurance policies in this country, 
And life insurance policies, as we're going to talk about, are an option to help people pay for care. So now you're starting to talk about a very large asset pool owned by people that they can tap into. Uh, and then annuities, another area that some people tap into to fund their retirement, their long-term career. There's over two and a half trillion dollars in annuities in this country today. So the unique financial challenges that are brought on by aging and declining health require a unique approach to financial solutions. Mm -hmm. People underestimate and or just don't even prepare for the cost of care and how that will impact them, their family, their retirement. So what are some of the solutions? Let's work through solutions that we've touched on in, in the beginning of, of today's episode. Long-term care insurance, obviously a viable option. Not enough people own it. Uh, the younger and healthier you are when you buy long-term care insurance, the more likely it is you're going to qualify, the lower the premiums are. But the trade-off is you're going to carry that policy for possibly decades before you're going to use it. So that's a big hindrance to why more people don't buy and, and have long-term care insurance. So what are some of the other options that in particular will help people address an immediate need for care? And that's a big part of the equation because the reality is we can preach and educate till we're blue in the face to people to save and prepare, be ready for the future. But the vast majority of people are really not going to start thinking about this until they're in it until there, there's an immediate need for care. The, as I said, the clock is ticking. There's urgency all around them. People are asking them questions. What do you have? How are you going to pay for it? What are you going to do? And you got to scramble. So let's start talking about some of these funding options to help people avoid long-term care bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. Let's start with an area we have specialized in for years, the LTC life settlement. This is using an existing life insurance policy that is an asset people can sell off, just like a home. Think of your life insurance policy just like your home. You make mortgage payments for years on your home, and then one day when you're, when you're done living in your home, do you drop your keys in the driveway and just walk away? Well, of course not. You sell your home for its market value. And, and that's money that can become very valuable, particularly in your senior years towards retirement or funding things like long-term care. Well, it's the same with a life insurance policy. They are both equally recognized as assets. So a home and a life insurance policy are personal property. And a life insurance policy has value. It's an asset with value. You make premium payments, just like mortgage payments, you're making premium payments on a life insurance policy for years one day when you're done with the policy, you have an outlet to actually liquidate that policy, to sell it, use it uh, for things like long-term care. So through an LTC life settlement, it is a way to take that life insurance policy, sell it through a life settlement, and then use that money to pay towards any kind of care you want. And I can tell you, having done this for so many years, assisted living companies, home care companies, everybody will accept the funds that come from an LTC life settlement, using those funds is a recognized Medicaid qualified spend down. So what you're able to do with this strategy is remain private pay for as long as you have funds from the LTC life settlement. But as you're spending it towards your care, you're also doing it in a Medicaid qualified spend down. So if you do get to a point where you have exhausted those funds, and your assets are dispositioned correctly, you could go on to Medicaid without any, any uh, hindrances. This mm -hmm. is a Medicaid qualified spend. And it's also a uh, tax advantaged way to use these funds. If you're using the funds from an LTC life settlement towards an immediate need for care, you've been underwritten, you, ha you have an immediate need for care, you have, two, let's say, two ADLs or more chronic condition, then uh, all the funds from that LTC life settlement are tax free. So you're selling off a life insurance policy to use for care and you're getting tax free funds that you're able to spend down private pay uh, and delay that need to go on to Medicaid. For many families we've worked with, instead of going on to Medicaid next month, they were able to be private pay for a couple of years and, and delay, if not outright avoid ever needing 
to spend down and go on to Medicaid. So a very advantageous tool for somebody to use. Why are people abandoning life insurance policies? Why would they look at doing this? Well, they can't afford the premiums anymore. They've outlived the reason for why they would want to hang on to the policy. They, they bought it years ago. They're still carrying it. The kids are grown up, have their own families. They don't need it anymore. They're going to get rid of it. And as I said, instead of just dumping it, you can take advantage of the fact that your life insurance policy, like your home, is an asset and it has market value. Like we pointed out, there's only 7.5 million long-term care insurance policies in this country, 260 million life insurance policies. The problem is, as Sarah, as many as 9 out of 10 people with life insurance will abandon their policy eventually in, without it ever paying a death benefit. So people take out life insurance, term life, universal life, whole life. And then over years of making premium payments, one day they decide, well, we're done with the policy. They just let it go. Too many people are throwing policies away without realizing they have this option. Mm -hmm. The seniors, and this is really important for the people in, in your audience, care providers to, to realize that on an annual basis, we're talking about over $200 billion worth of life insurance policies that people could be using in mm -hmm. this way. They, they, they Either they're going to throw them away or they're going to, a few will keep them to the end. Many more will throw them away. And then those that are smart enough and realize this is an option they can get to, they could use it to help them pay for care. Now, the but good Many don't know. And that's the problem, right, Chris? That's why we were on this mission to make sure every senior and every care provider, every adult child, knows that this exists. Well, exactly. And, and and so the good news is we have some help. There's a lot of advertising and promotion now. People are seeing on TV, TV commercials every day about life settlements, reverse mortgages, Medicare Advantage plans. If you're watching, you know, Fox News or CNN or ESPN or any, you know, pr cable programming, you are seeing in heavy rotation reverse mortgage commercials, life settlement commercials, Medicare Advantage commercials, and pharmacy commercials. Those are like the big four. So people are more aware now of life settlements than ever before. And on an annual basis, we're talking about four and a half billion dollars of life settlements being conducted uh, in this country. But the pool of of seniors who could be accessing this is much more. So, so there is more awareness and so for, for anybody who's working in care that brings up the topic, there's a, there's a good, a much better chance today than there would have been 10, 10, 15 years ago that there's going to be some recognition. There's going to be some understanding of, oh, yeah, no, I've seen commercials about mm -hmm. life settlements. You could be sitting on a gold mine with a life insurance policy. Don't throw it away. Uh, that's interesting. I, I'm not sure how I would do that. And that's your opportunity then to forward them to the experts that you're working with who would take them through the process, qualify them, take them through and, and help them then access that as a financial solution. Mm -hmm. So when you're thinking about who qualifies for, for this, and quite frankly, most of these private pay solutions, we're talking about people that are 65, 70 and above, um, that have impaired health conditions. If you're going to get the veterans benefit, if you're going to qualify for life settlements, you're, you have impaired health, you're older. In fact, think of it this way. The older and sicker somebody is, the more likely it is they're going to qualify for one of these programs. And, and with, with, in the case of a life settlement, the more money they're going to get from using that option. Any kind of life insurance qualifies, universal life, term life, whole life, any kind of policy qualifies. The minimum size of a policy is $100,000 of death benefit and above. So this universe that would qualify for not only life settlements, but reverse mortgages, veterans benefits, senior bridge loans, that's the exact universe you're talking to every day. It's, mm -hmm. it's people who are aging, people who need care and people who have a financial need, they just don't understand that there are options that they can access. Mm -hmm. I'll quickly cover a couple more of them, give you a quick, a quick uh, a brush on reverse mortgages, other, also known as a home equity conversion mortgage, a HECM. Uh, it's secured by the value of the loan. What I like about reverse mortgages 
for seniors is that it gives you a way to access the, 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 the equity in your home without selling it. And when you take a reverse mortgage out, you don't have to be making monthly payments. So if you took out just a normal loan, you know you have to be t- making monthly payments. With a reverse mortgage, you're able to access the equity of your home in three ways. You're able to either take it as a lump sum, set up a, a monthly income being paid to you, or you can set up a um, line of credit uh, and, and tap into it when you want um, as needed. So you have a lot of flexibility. You don't need to be making monthly payments. Now, the downside of reverse mortgage is that you're accruing interest. Uh, so when the loan becomes due, when you leave the home, which typically people will sell the home to satisfy the reverse mortgage and pay it off, you're paying off all of the accrued interest fees and, and, and the principal amount that was taken out as part of the reverse mortgage. Mm -hmm. Um, To qualify for reverse mortgage, you're you're age 62 and older, the home's your primary residence. Um, And and as I said, you're going to accrue interest and you're going to pay it back when you leave, but you don't need to pay back or make any payments on the reverse mortgage as long as you're living in that home. Now for the VA aid and attendance benefit, this is for for veterans who have served uh, a in a period of active uh, war, active duty during a period of wartime. And for most veterans, they would meet that qualification. You meet that qualification, it will pay out if you have, if you qualify both medically and financially, you will get a monthly payment towards your long-term care services. As a standalone veteran, you'd receive, this is the 2024 rates, uh, $2,050 a month. You can also get payments on a monthly basis, the veteran and their spouse together at a higher level of $2,431 a month. And the surviving spouse, if the veteran's dead, could also qualify for uh, $1,318 a month. So, So this is a way to take advantage of your veteran status and help pay towards long term care costs. You need to have been honorably discharged from the military served a minimum of 90 days of active duty with one day served during a period of war. There are some income and asset limits that are applied towards applying uh, uh, for for the benefit. If you're making too much, if you have too much, you you wouldn't qualify. Think of it in some ways kind of like the Medicaid process, although the numbers in the process aren't exactly the same. Minimum age of 65 and a need for care. Senior bridge loans, this is another way to tap into your home as a bridge to getting into care. Let's say somebody needs to actually get out of their home. They got to get into assisted living. They got to get into nursing home care. They want to move into a CCRC, a continuing care retirement community, maybe memory care, but they got to get out of the home. So they need to sell the home. Well, that can take some time. You know, it's not going to happen overnight, but your care needs, maybe they can't wait. 90 days, six months, a year to, to, to sell the home. Well, you can use the home as a short-term uh, um, asset to bridge a loan against it for your care needs and only take out what you need on a monthly basis that then will actually be paid directly towards the care provider. So you've got the home for sale, you move into an assisted living community, it's $5,000 a month, you, you qualify for the senior bridge loan. It starts making a $5,000 a month payment towards your care needs. Six months later, the home is sold. The balance is 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 paid back to the senior bridge loan uh, to liquidate that loan. Um, and uh, you've been able to get into the care you needed and you didn't wait six months while waiting to sell the house and, and be in a position to make that move. Mm-hmm. So another great tool using your assets that you may not realize you, this is a way that you can do it to solve these equations. So Sarah, in concluding, I just want to kind of wrap up with the realities and solutions. The reality is that the U S is an aging population Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there's limited financial safety nets. There's only so much Medicare, Medicaid, social security can pay out. People uh, unfortunately are, are particularly overly reliant many of them on social security 
as a primary part of their retirement and make a move towards Medicaid very quickly without exploring all of their options, these alternative financial options beyond a long-term care insurance policy, how to use an annuity, how to use a life settlement, a long-term care life settlement, a reverse mortgage, veterans benefit, senior bridge loans. You have a whole basket full of solutions that you can work with families on to help them bridge the gap, to get into the care, pay for the care they need, whether it's home-based, whether it's facility-based. Um, and it's really just a matter of education, letting people know these, these options exist, and then forwarding them to the experts that can then provide the service for them in partnership, working with you. And let me tell you something, as care providers, none of these options cost you anything. You don't have to pay to have these options as part of your practice, as part of what you're doing. In fact, some of these options will actually even pay you referral fees for having used their options. Some will, some won't. You need to explore how to incorporate these into your practice at no cost to you, even enhancing sometimes your the revenue coming into, into your business. And number one, accomplishing the mission, the goal of getting a family financially able to pay for the care that they that they need, they deserve, and you so desperately want to provide. Mm -hmm. That was a great recap, Chris. Thank you so much for sharing this super valuable information. Absolutely. Absolutely, Sarah. It's always a pleasure. I'm glad we could, we could connect today and go over all this. I, I just can't encourage people enough to be thinking in terms of being a solution provider and not a salesperson. Mm -hmm. Right. Know, Stop trying to sell what you do and start trying to solve people's problems with what you do as part of the solution, but having the total package to bring it all together and really make it happen as opposed to just crossing your fingers and hoping the person you talk to can figure out how to pay for, for, for what you've presented to them. Well, in my opinion, I'm not sure if you've heard me say this before. I know a lot of my students have. I mean, I personally believe that if we do not educate ourselves as senior care professionals on these resources, then we're being negligent in our duty, right? Because we're not prepared mm -hmm. to educate these families on these resources, right? And these resources could very well make a huge difference in their end of life experience, right? The, the quality that they receive in their end of life, if they were able to access some of these resources and remain in home if that's what they want or go to that senior living community. So I would really urge any of you that um, are salespeople, um, elder care advisors, senior care advisors, whatever you want to call yourself, but you're in a position where you're out there developing relationships with referral sources and dealing with families and, and trying to get them care options, definitely continue to educate yourselves on these alternative funding solutions because, um, you have a big impact in people's end of life experience. So Chris, thank you so much for being my guest. If people want more information, where can they go to learn more about retirement genius and or directly contact you or your organization? Well, if you want to contact us directly, you can uh, go to our website, www.retirementgenius.com. Uh, and you could also give us a call at 888 I mean, 866, excuse me, 866 602 5000. Mm -hmm. uh, and you could email us at info at retirementgenius.com. Obviously, Sarah has information about all the topics that I've covered today. Uh, she has she has some excellent partners that, that she works with. We all work together uh, mm -hmm. closely to, 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 to educate you in the industry and then be there as a resource for you and the families you're working with. Sarah has information galore about all the you know brochures, videos, anything educational that you would want to, to use to look at and but don't hesitate to reach out to, to us directly as well. Thank you very much, Chris, for being a guest once again on the Empowering Aging podcast. And I really appreciate anybody that tuned in live today for being here. Um, this will be downloaded and uploaded to the Connector Elders YouTube channel. So if you see this playing live on Facebook, but 
uh, you want to check it out, download it, share it with your friends, please uh, go to the Connector Elders YouTube channel. And I hope everybody enjoys the rest of your day.